Coming up today, Korea's ruling party agrees to submit a controversial law recently vetoed by President Park and Hay to Parliament for reconsideration. As a result, the main opposition party calls off its boycott of parliamentary activities. The banks are shut and cash machines virtually empty in Greece as the country looks almost certain to default on its debt. Global markets stumble as well as the crisis approaches its endgame. First, Korean manufacturer's business confidence plunges to its lowest level in years as concerns grow the MERS outbreak will further worsen already feeble domestic demand. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello, it's noon on Tuesday the 30th of June. You're tuned into our midday newscast here on Adidang TV. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We start at the National Assembly, which has seen a burst of activity today. The National Assembly Speaker has decided to call a revote on a controversial piece of legislation that President Park Geun-hye vetoed last week. Jung Yi Hua said he made the decision because the National Assembly has a duty to protect the Constitution. The ruling Shanuri party agreed to hold a plenary session on Monday to handle the revision to the National Assembly Act. But the party's lawmakers are not expected to vote on the bill, with Shanuri party floor leader Yu Sung Min saying participation in Monday's session is not aimed at voting on the issue. Still, as a result of the Speaker's decision, the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy says it will lift its current boycott of parliamentary affairs. The revision would grant lawmakers this new law the right to challenge executive enactments such as gov the government's enforcement ordinances. Now, Korea's ruling party is still mulling the fate of its embattled floor leader, Yoo Sung Min. A high level meeting on Monday failed to reach a decision on what to do, but officials say they expect you to do what is best for the party. Jim Young Gil reports. As pressure mounts for his Henry Party floor leader, Yoo Sung Min, to step down, members of the party's Supreme Council held a closed door gathering on Monday to decide his fate. During the meeting, Yu is said to have asked for another chance and some time to ponder whether or not he should carry on the job. However, Henry lawmakers loyal to President Park continue to urge for Yu's resignation. They blame him for creating a rift between the president and ruling camp. I believe floor leader Yu Sung Min will make a wise decision for our party. Yu had worked with the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy Party to negotiate a deal to soften a revision to the National Assembly law as a precondition to passing another bill to reform the debt-ridden pension system for government employees. But President Park opposed the concession and vetoed the controversial law last week. Meanwhile, the MPAD continues to blast the ruling party for bowing to the president's wishes. Additionally, they have voiced strong criticism against President Park for pressuring Yu to give up his post, emphasizing that the revisions to the parliamentary law received bipartisan support. President Bakken's pressure on the ruling party floor leader to step down is itself unconstitutional behavior that encroaches on the National Assembly's rights and the separation of powers. The MPAD is threatening to continue its boycott of all parliamentary sessions if the revised law isn't put up for a revote in the National Assembly. Kim young Arirang News. Now, the National Assembly's Health and Welfare Committee on Monday approved a proposed revision to the nation's Quarantine Act. Under the revision, people who travel to countries designated as infectious disease control regions must report to the nation's quarantine authority. The revision also allows health authorities to obtain the flight information of people with suspected infections. However, the committee is yet to reach an agreement on how to support people diagnosed with MERS and medical institutions that treated people with the virus, but they have vowed to continue their discussions on the matter. 
And Korean health authorities have confirmed an additional death from the MERS outbreak here in Korea. However, no new cases have been reported since Saturday, leading them to cautiously suggest the outbreak is on the way now. The latest victim was a 81-year-old female patient who had existing health conditions. With the latest death, the fatality rate of MERS in Korea has risen to 18% still far lower than the global average of 40 percent. As we said, the number of confirmed cases remains unchanged for the third consecutive day at 182. In addition, two more patients, both in their 60s, have made full recoveries. This raises the number of patients discharged from hospital to 95. Meanwhile, Pyeongtaek St. Mary's Hospital in Gyeonggi-do province where Korea's first patient was treated before his case was confirmed on May 20th, says it will resume normal operations from Wednesday after the government lifted a quarantine order on the hospital. Sluggish demand and disappointing exports have rocked the business confidence of local manufacturers. An index measuring their sentiment has plunged to a low not seen since the height of the global financial crisis. Companies have also seen business conditions nosedive since the start of the MERS outbreak. Kim min -ji reports. Business conditions for firms in Korea continue to sour in June with the key index dipping to its lowest level in more than six years. According to the Bank of Korea, the business survey index in the manufacturing sector tumbled to 66, down seven points on month. That's the lowest since March 2009 when it recorded 56, and even lower than the months following last year's Seoro ferry disaster. A number below 100 means a larger number of firms feel pessimistic. The index had been on a steady rise this year, but fell in May. Experts attribute the downturn this month to a number of components. Business sentiment has not been on the good side due to slowing exports and overall weak global economic growth. The MERS outbreak also had a big impact on the June figures. Concerns have been mounting in the wake of the MERS outbreak, which has negatively affected consumption, with the leisure, transportation and retail sectors hit the hardest. In fact, figures for the non-manufacturing sector also fell 11 points on month to 65 in June. Experts say business confidence may start to pick up in the second half of the year should the MERS outbreak wane and when the effects of the government's supplementary budget start to show up. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. South Korea and the United States will continue to maintain their defense posture against North Korean provocations through combined military drills and new defense strategies based on a conditions-based transfer of wartime operational control. The plan was announced at a biannual meeting of roughly 150 top commanding officers and military officials and it was chaired by South Korean Defense Minister Han min -gu earlier on this Tuesday. The meeting was also used to assess the country's four pillars of defense management, its military readiness posture and plans in the defense arena for the second half of the year. The meeting also concluded that South Korea maintained its stability and security in the first half of the year by proactively responding to military threats from North Korea. South Korea's defense ministry is looking to extend the deadline for downsizing the nation's standing armed forces to some 500,000 soldiers. The ministry says it has taken the first steps towards drawing up a new bill to delay the current 2022 deadline to 2030. A ministry official says the plan remains the same, but the revision will resolve the disconnect between the current law and the defence reform plan and provide more flexibility for unforeseen circumstances. Last March, the defence ministry introduced a reform plan for 2014 to 2030, which included the downsizing of its standing forces from the current 630,000 to 522,000 by the year 2022. This comes amid the shrinking birth rate here in South Korea, where all able-bodied men are required to serve in the military for some two years in their 20s. 
A South Korean civilian group is visiting North Korea today to discuss the details of a planned trip there by Lee Hee Ho, the widow of former President Kim Dae Jung. Five representatives from the Kim Dae Jung Peace Center crossed the border on Tuesday morning for a day trip to the North Korean border city of Kaesong. Former First Lady Lee wants to visit North Korea as early as next month. And if the trip takes place as planned, there is speculation she might be able to meet with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The former First Lady has been seeking to visit the North to provide North Korean children with hand-knit hats, scarves and clothes. The U.S. Special Envoy for North Korea Policy held talks with senior South Korean officials in Seoul on Monday. Sung Kim, who is in Korea for an international forum on Korean reunification, met with his South Korean counterpart Hwang Jung-guk and Deputy Foreign Minister Kim Hong-gyun at the Foreign Ministry. Speaking following the talks, the U.S. officials said the two sides discussed a broad range of issues bilateral issues and their coordination on North Korea. A senior uh, South Korean official said the Allies reaffirmed their intent to push for talks with North Korea without any preconditions. Now, Greece is edging closer to a messy divorce from the Eurozone, with the global market growing extremely anxious over the looming uncertainties Posed by the crisis in Greece, the country doesn't have much time at all before its bailout programme and IMF repayment deadline expire. Shin Se-min reports. Time is running out. There are only hours left before Greece's current bailout package and its 1.8 billion US dollar loan repayment to the International Monetary Fund come due. The country's total accumulated debt is well over 350 billion U.S. dollars, 270 billion of which is owned to the European Central Bank, the International Monetary Fund and other Eurozone countries. The June 30 deadline was set by the Eurogroup earlier this year and is attached to a series of demands for economic reforms. Late Friday, Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras threw a country into turmoil when he announced a referendum on the question of whether to accept the demands. A yes vote means voters accept the austerity measures proposed by Greece's creditors. A no vote could mean voters are choosing a path that will most likely rip them from the eurozone, which experts say would result in heightened volatility in global markets that are already fluctuating over the uncertainty in Greece. The vote is set to take place this coming Sunday. But Athens is already in crisis. The banks are shut, ATM withdrawals are limited to 60 euros, and Greeks are lined up at supermarkets hoping to stockpile essentials. Greece is at the most critical moment of its modern history, faced with the prospect of disaster, a true disaster, unprecedented in times of peace. With the looming uncertainties over the situation in Greece, global markets are shaky, with the U.S. stock market plunging 350 points. The losses also wiped out all the gains in European markets, with the Dow and the S&P 500 indexes falling at least 2 percent. Asian stocks also stumbled, with China's markets falling again Tuesday. Korean stocks edged up in early trading after the benchmark Kospi index finished at a one-week low. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The leaders of Korea and Japan could hold a summit in the future if a three-way summit with China takes place in the autumn. This is according to Japan's Deputy Foreign Minister Shinsuke Sugiyama, who made the statement during a lecture in Tokyo on Monday while addressing the possibility of a bilateral summit between the two countries. Now, Japan's Kyoto News Agency cited Sugiyama as saying that the main question is now whether China will join a three-way summit. If realized, it would be the first trilateral summit since May 2012 and a first Seoul-Tokyo bilateral summit since President Park Geun-hye took office in February 2013. The Japanese government is facing growing public resistance against its drive to pass a set of controversial security bills that would rip up Japan's post-war pacifist constitution and enable the country to come to the military aid of an ally under attack. According to Japan's Kyoto News Agency, a Japanese civic organization called Anti-War Committee of 1000 gathered more than 1.65 million signatures from people demanding the parliament to give up this legislation. The committee, which launched the signature collecting campaign in January, promised to 
continue with the initiative and protest against what they see as the government's efforts to turn the country back towards militarism. Antibiotic consumption in Korea continues to be on a downward trend, but it's still higher than most countries. Data released by the Health Insurance Review and Assessment Service on Tuesday shows the antibiotic prescription rate for acute upper respiratory infections, such as the common cold, had fallen to 43% last year. That's down sharply from 74% in 2002. However, the Institute noted that the figure is still higher than the OECD average. Officials at the Institute plan to visit medical institutions with particularly high prescription rates to explain to them the dangers of overuse, including antibiotic resistance in the body. Well, that's all we have for now. I'm Mark Broom. Have a wonderful day and thank you, as always, for tuning in. And we hope to see you at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.